And so this morning, uh, give Don Rooks a hand as he comes and shares the word of God with you. Test, 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 test. I failed everything else. Test, 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 test. Are we there? I, are you going to be able to take me from here if yeah, I stay up. right here? Back up. Oh, I don't want that big old thing. Oh, dude, it's too late. Good. good. <laughs> wow. This is just in case I fall. All right. Let me just. Okay. Let me let me just give you a, a quick synopsis of who and what we are. We're Connecting Point Ministry, and I should have gave you that print up or the. Yeah, the logo that you could put on the screen up here. But um, we are Connecting Point Ministry. Um, I've been in church my whole life since I was three or so. And all I've ever done is go to church. I was preaching when I was 15. Went to seminary when I got right out of high school. Uh, met my wife. Uh, uh, you know, they talk about pursuing and uh, she and about 50 other girls pursued me. <laughs> but she was the fastest. And she's from Texas, so she carried rattlesnakes. If you know Sweetwater, Texas, rattlesnake capital of the world, they had big rattlesnake roundups, but she brought those and that's how she captured me. I didn't want to be bit. Uh, so anyway, and so we, we met and felt, felt it in love, and uh, we got married my, right after my second year, or my, for my senior year, we married our first year in school, left there, went to Baltimore, Maryland, and things I learned about the Northeast at that time kept me from not wanting to ever come back up this way again. <laughs> Uh, reaffirm them every time I come. This is not the Midwest, folks. <laughs> Trust me. There's a like a church on every corner in the Midwest. Uh, there's only mean, angry people up here. No, I'm just kidding. They're not mean, angry people. Most of them aren't anyway, but a lot of them are. So, uh, But that's why you're here, so you can change that, I think. I hope you do anyway, because it's really harsh to get out and get honked at. Oh, no, that's the preacher. That's Everybody waves at us when we're going down the street. Is that one finger wave is just it's your fine buying in the street. So where was I? Uh, oh yeah. Anyway, so I worked with young people, and everything we touched in ministry, God just blossomed. Uh, left there, went home. We were there for a year. Went to Homestead, Florida. Went with had a. A 16 or youth department the first Sunday we were there and uh, six months a year later we were running over 300 it, it, it went started church in Houston and uh, Houston's a different kind of town it's not a Texas town it's, it's typically uh, inter, it's a very intermingled city very international and we started the church there kind of like your pastor did and I want to commend him for coming out and just going out good go ahead yeah for coming out and and with a hammer and a chisel and uh, just grinding out of work here because uh, it's not easy not easy to start a church and so you hang in there with him God one day you're going to be amazed at the doubling effect that happens uh, the momentum that picks up so you hang with him pray for him this is pastor appreciation month it's not going to hurt you take your, fa your pastor's family out to eat give them a couple extra dollars every once in a while say go enjoy your time uh, they deserve that so you do that. But that brings me to pastoring and then um, about almost 29 years ago, uh, my wife, I was pastoring. I was winning the world to Jesus. Church had gone well. Church, right after that, the economy fell apart and we lost everything. And so I'm a guy, yeah, and I just charging hill with a squirt gun. I'll go back and start over. And at that time, my wife came and said, I'm not going with you. Uh, I don't want to be in ministry. I don't want to be with you. I don't want anything to do with them. As a preacher, my life's over. 
uh, it's done. And a lot of things went into that, so I'll make this story short. Uh, I called, called a bunch of people. One of them was my uncle, who's my mentor in ministry, pastor in forever. And we got connected with Rafa Counseling Centers. I don't know if you're familiar. They were real wide across the country several years ago. But Dr. Robert McGee, who started Rafa, Dr. Um, James Mahoney and Dixon Murrah got together with Sagemont Church in Houston. They put on what they were going to call Stress the Ministry Conference for only preachers, missionaries uh, at that time. And so we're going into getting help for us. And they invited us to this conference. Uh, at that time, we were so poor. You know, uh, typical ministry, uh, we were have two pennies to work, rub together. And my wife was not real happy with me wanting to go to another pastor's type conference. You should be sharing this with me. Come on. Yeah, you do this better than I do anyway. <laughs> She's the best part about our teaching. Uh, so anyway, we went uh, went into that conference. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> They regretted that. You, no, I will regret that. Oh, Lord. So, I think every married wife ought to have a microphone. Yours is not so on. Much yours, <laughs> yours is not on, thank goodness. Mine is not on, but that's okay. I don't need it. Uh, okay. I told them when we started Friday night, I said, watch how many times she says, I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> and she sat up here and said, I'm not going to say anything. This is all on you. You're going to go up, and then he gives her a microphone. <laughs> So you want to share, we went. To, we were going to the conference. I used to be really, really shy, but I got over it as fast as I could. Yeah, to <laughs> my I've dismay. I've saved up a lot to say since then, okay? Okay, so we've got to get to the message right, so pretty we quickly. Went to, so we went to this conference, and uh, the, I promise you, I did not want to be around any other preachers. I I thought they all had a plastic face, and they were fake, and they were different on, on Mondays and Tuesdays. My husband... Uh, my husband treated me like I was just another member or even not even that good. If you called telling him that you had a cold, he would be there for you. It didn't matter what our family was being over. Uh, we talked about this weekend holes in my heart. I had a lot of holes in my heart from growing up, and my husband just affirmed that I was not worth anything, just not worth anything. He didn't know he was doing it, but that's how I felt. So after 18 years of marriage, I didn't want to start over again. And have you ever felt like you, you couldn't do anything right, a complete failure? That's the way I felt. I was a totally complete failure, couldn't do anything right. So I knew that if I left my husband, he would be better off. He would just go on. I did not know. I did not know because he never let me know that it would crush his soul. He just didn't have it in him to tell me how much he cared or, or how much he loved me. So that was my first awakening up. We went to this, spe this meeting, and it was a stupid meeting because I use stupid because it's a Texas word. And it was a stupid pastor's meeting. But during that meeting, I found out that my marriage problems, my marriage problems, <laughs> hello? My marriage problem was not Don. My marriage problems was Cheryl and what, the garbage that I brought into my. When I, reali when I realized, I thought my world would be fine without Don. And when I, I'm sorry, and when I realized that it was, when I realized it was not done, I looked at him and I started crying. And I thought, oh my God, what did I almost lose? What did I almost do? God did a miracle. We started sharing with other people. And you know how church people are. On Sunday morning, we're all fine, but we all lie. We're not fine. And so God has used our, blessed our, our pain. Not waste it. Yeah. No, 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 no. You're not done. You're just going <laughs> to sit back down and talk. So, but that was, um, th this year will be 29 years. Next year will be our 30th year. It'll be 30th year starting the conference. The guy that started working with us at the conference, uh, Dr. Jim Mahoney, a uh, brilliant man, a great man of God, counselor. At that time, uh, counseling was a new age movement, and I thought everybody's going to hell. They've been to counseling, and you didn't go to counseling. You went to church. Then I come to find out that uh, there's some good counselors out there, and there's some people that can pour into my life and make me better. And this guy poured into my life. Uh, they once we had such a 
we call it heart changes. And my wife had such a miraculous heart change that it just changed everything uh, on that Thursday night. And so they said, come back and give her, if you come back, share your story. This is so amazing. And so we went back, shared the story for the next two callers. Dr. Mahoney got uh, pancreatic cancer, it lasted six months. And at that time, Dixon said, would you come on board? Well, I was one of my greatest mentors at that time. Uh, so I came back on board with Dixon. We did six conferences a year in Houston, sponsored by uh, Sagemont Church and Rafa Council Center, and we went overseas twice. Uh, Twelve, no, 17 years ago this year, I left the church in Galveston. I was pastoring. The guy that was on staff with me uh, had been through our conference, knew, knew where we were, and so we called him co-pastor, and then he took over the church. And we left. I didn't want to have any burden on him. And so I wanted to go, go leave out, get out of town and let him be able to pastor the church on his own. And so uh, we left the church. I mean, you know, all the good stuff you get with church. Sometimes you get stuff. I mean, you know, credit card to buy lunch or something and go to meetings and stuff. And we left all that stuff behind and just went by faith. And we just decided in that moment, it's just God or not. And that was almost 17 years ago. And uh, God has been greater to us and more blessed to us than any two other people I know. My wife will tell you, we've probably been through a lot more pain than most people have been through. But God has blessed us. And part of the reason he's blessed us, and I share that with you, let me just share a couple of statistics, not to, sh not to scare you, but to give you knowledge. They, focus on the family says 1,700 Ministers a month walk away from ministry. We have like 3,000 churches, I, I forget if it's a, a month or a week, that close in our country. We wonder why our country is going to hell in a bread basket, why everything's taking place in our country. It's because we as a church are, are failing. And it starts with the pulpit, and it starts because we were trained wrong. And we were trying to win the world to Jesus and not take care of our number one ministry, which is our spouse. And I say that to you if you missed the conference this weekend. Your number one ministry is not your job. It's not even this church. It's your, it's your spouse. It's not your kids. It's your spouse. Your kids are down the line. And God's given. It's like taxes. God's a given. If God's not in your life, there's no hope. But God is first, then your wife, serving God, then your church. Your pastor will tell you that. He's been teaching that. And then you, all the other things that fall in place. Did you see that? God, wife, church, then your job. I hate people moving to a town without church, searching out to see if there's not a good church to attend before they move there. Or not wanting to go help get a church started. And so, uh, again, I commend you for stepping in and helping chunk out and grind out this church here. Uh, there are so many other statistics. I won't share all of them, but let me just, uh, these two. Uh, five out of ten um, drop out of ministry in the first five years. One in ten make it to retirement. So you see, we're, we're fighting a battle, and Satan knows it. So if he can't discourage this man right here, he'll go to his wife. And if he can't discourage her, and that's where he got with us, he'll go to your kids. And we have a story with our kids that Satan just tried to, de to destroy us. So you pray for your pastor, you pray for his wife, you pray for his girls. Okay, that wherever they go, they don't burn down another house. I mean, <laughs> what is that all about? You know, gee, wow, do you have to do that? And Sherry said, this is great. I'm getting all new stuff. But I said, that's not nice. That's not nice. Um, th that didn't need to be there. I should not have done that. <laughs> Your kids are not here this morning, are they? Oh, this is on the internet. <laughs> they can see it. Okay. <laughs> Forgive me, okay, girls? I didn't mean that. So, anyway, 
So pray for us. Uh, we do three conferences a year in Branson, Missouri, and we only have five or six couples per conference. As a missionary, a preacher, a staff person, or one of their kids. If you know someone that's in ministry, or if you've got someone that's a, a, a out of a minister's home, we invite them to come to our conference. The one of the problems with us for that is that we do not charge anyone to come to our conference. Now, if you go to a conference like what we do, and I don't know if you ever checked this, but there's two of them in the Branson area, and one of them is $4,000 for three days. So if you go to get counseling, you're going to pay $200 an hour. Or if you go to a retreat-type packet, you're going to pay $3,000 and above. There's one in Colorado that's amazing. It's uh, Marble Falls, Dr. McBurney. But he starts at $7,000 for a week for a couple. So you can see maybe we ought to be charging. <laughs> but we don't. Because what we said, we may not be here today if God had not allowed it to not cost us anything to go to that first conference. So our life is spent paying it forward. So the second part of that is that we pay it forward in churches. The church is not any healthier than its families. And I'm afraid we have very unhealthy church, fan, church families because it's about relationship. And you're only as strong as your weakest church member is. So you need to remember that. And I encourage our older folks here, uh, older couples, to get involved with the young couples. Look around here. It's good, nice to see. I was afraid we're going to have all old folks. <laughs> and then there's Precious. <laughs> Whoever lives to be that old. <laughs> Just, I told her I'm coming back when she gets married, though. <laughs> if I live that long. <laughs> If I live that long, yeah, that's when, yeah. So um, anyway, but we've met some very nice people, and we've loved our weekend with you. So uh, I guess I ought to do what I'm supposed to be doing this morning, and that's giving you our message for today. <laughs> we do a, I do a five-packet teaching on forgiveness. Um, I think one of the most misunderstood things in our churches today is the word forgiveness. Everybody's heard it. Everybody's talked about it. And most everybody says, I've forgiven. We've been taught it from the word of God. And we have forgiven word biblically. But then we have to look at life and we say, why does it bug me so much? Why does seeing that person in church or that person in town or seeing that, that uh, family member, why is it every time I see them or think about them, I just go, Gee! I wish they were dead, you know? Uh, probably because we haven't learned what real forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness is letting God have permission to control your life. Forgiveness is letting God have permission to control your life. It's trust slash control. It's either trust or control. It is substituting control for love. What happens, we want to control things in our life because we can't learn to love things in our life. And that's John 3, 16, talking about for God so loved, God didn't so control, God so loved the world. If God had so controlled the world, he'd have sent every one of us to hell because that's what we would actually deserve. But God has forgiven us, and that's what we're going to talk about in those three areas of forgiveness. Uh, C.S. Lewis says this, Forgiveness is a beautiful word to have something or someone to forgive. It is an actual act exercise of our faith because it takes complete dependence on God to forgive. Several verses of Scripture, I'm going to use Matthew chapter 18 for my text point and verses 15 through 35 
He's talking about brother trespass against you, what to do. Peter says, then then Peter said to him, uh, how all should I forgive my brother that sins against me? Uh, and I forgive him till seven times because Peter thought, hey man, seven number of perfection. I'm just going to go for the top. And then Jesus said, I say not unto thee seven times, but until 70 times seven that's not a number just to be a number. That's a number that says you're to forgive or work with the forgiveness till it's an absolute no-brainer to you. Forgiveness just automatically can happen after those times that you have. It's like a bad accident. You see a bad accident or you're in a bad accident, you tell somebody. And it's still rough, but you tell somebody else, and you tell somebody else, and, you tell, and eventually this, it becomes a story to you. And your forgiveness should be your story of things that have happened to you that you have let go and let God, and now becomes a testimony to other people. Our story is different than a God, and it's like a God. We tell telling the pastor, someone mentioned to me in Sunday school, we're not like most people do marriage conferences. And someone mentioned this morning, they've been to a lot of marriage conferences and, and really wasn't looking forward to coming to this one. And I don't blame you because I've been to those. I want to sleep if my wife wouldn't keep punching me. But we're different because we'll get you out of your head and into your heart. And that's what we have to work to unforgiveness and this again in this story is talking about an unforgiving servant and let me just get past the first one forgiven the second one we know the story did not forgive and it says christ allowed him or the king allowed him to be turned over to the tormentors just don't have time this morning but you go through and study tormentors and what that means and then look around in your life even look around your church life and you look at people we're people, people. We love watching people. We'll sit here and watch you folks come in and out of church, or we'll sit down at the restaurant and watch people move around. Now, one thing that bothers us about people we see, even in churches, they're tormented. You see the, the hurt in their, their eyes. They're tormented. You see, that's what happens when a person, a family, a church, a nation doesn't learn how to forgive. So that's why, again, I believe forgiveness is one of the most misunderstood things in the church today. How do we learn to forgive then? How does it happen that I want to know how to forgive? Somebody says, well, I just want to be the best forgiving person in the world. How do I learn to forgive? We learn to forgive by being in pain. You can't learn to forgive something if you've never been there to forgive something so we must learn to have the pain so God allows the pain to give us to be more like him because pain makes us realize that we're alive makes us realize that we have a problem and it makes us realize we need to move to action to make a change because most of us get in that rut you were here this weekend when my wife was sharing about our son in high school. My son's got one of the best personalities in the world. Walks in a room, he takes over. Just wow. And got into drugs. And that became a rut for him. And we wanted to fix him and kept fixing him, kept fixing him, kept fixing him until we realized we had stepped back and forgive his actions and let him be. And let God bring him to the point that he was changed the last two years have been two of the most amazing years of his life I tell people tell me well i can't find a job well, let me let my old son teach you he's got a terrible background and he's out there he's working two jobs he wrote me this morning he said dad i'm going to three churches today he goes to our churches his church and there's a bloom church in town that he goes over because he's got friends over there he does jesus is homeless on monday night and rescue the perishing or whoever that is on thursday night besides his jobs you can do it you make a choice and he had to do a lot of forgiveness in his life pain becomes being hurt and offended by by people in the church 
sometimes by the clothes we wear, the movies we go to, the dance we dance, or if you were here this week and you understand what I mean by the dance we dance and the music we listen to, it reveals a deeper emotional problem that's going on in our life, the deeper, deeper, intense things are going on. Because the problem is never the problem. We like to fix the problem. We like to fix the presenting. But people come to us with marriage problems, and we sit down and we we tell them to tell us right down what you want. And I get their list back, and the one that's got the longest list is the one that has the most problems. A lot of times we want to come to the pastor and we want him to fix our problems. He said, you just got to work on some of your own issues. You need to learn to forgive, abandonment, abuse. Hurt people, hurt people. It is our actual opportunity to serve God by adjusting our truth to his truth. See, there's only one truth in this world, and that's right here. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you philosophize. Yeah, help me out, precious. Uh, I don't care what you think about something. Take it to the Word of God and examine, find the truth. Now, there's things from the Word of God that you and I may disagree a little bit about. Style of music, style of wear, uh, going to movies or dancing. There's little things we may disagree. We may even disagree of whether we're pre-trib or a-trib or wannabe trib. Okay, you may not know what those words are, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of arguments in church. Whether we have one service, two service, or four service, all those are presenting issues that says we need to step back and learn how to forgive one another. We'll change everything. I'm not sure why I'm on the notes there, dear. You just might come follow me and help me out. What? Oh, good. That's great. She said I'm doing good, so we'll be here all day. We will change everything. We'll change our jobs. We'll change houses. We'll change spouses. Should I repeat that one? We'll change churches. We'll change everything before we change ourselves. For some reason, we like, don't like where we are, but it feels good. Man, the pool of Bethesda had been there for 39 long years, it said, but it felt good. That was normal. Children of abuse. They marry into marriage, uh, abusive relationships. Why? Because that feels good. I'm not telling you to get run, run, but I'm saying get help. Get to the point that God can do something in your life. I mentioned to him this weekend, most of us it, want to just be better. If you want to be better, take a snake and aspirin. That just works out of way. But what we want to do and what we deal with ours is we want you to be healed. We want to surgery. And we will hit you and put probe and my wife will ask you questions that you don't want to hear questions because you don't want to answer that. And we just keep probing until we find the place. Most of you know I'm going in surgery November the 9th. And I started having problems with my neck. And today doctoral or medical thing has got so messed up that I went with my doctor and he really can't do anything so he prescribes pills and sends me to a, to sent me to a chiropractor come back and that wasn't helping so he sent me to an acupuncture you know what an acupuncture is that's where they stick these long old needles in you and poking in you could be coming out the other side I don't like needles period <laughs> so my wife went with me and held my hand <laughs> Why are you poking needles in me? They did cupping. I came back and said, it's not doing any good. So we're going through all these things. And finally, he said, we have an x-ray. And he said, well, you need an MRI. You know what an MRI is? That's where they take a big old uh, cannon and poke you inside of it and see how much loud noise they can, you can stand while you're in there for 30, 45 minutes. 
And they got it back, and he said, we're going to send you to a neurosurgeon. I went in and sat down with a neurosurgeon, here's what she said. She said, we can't do the easy part. We're going to have to go right to the major. Some of you may be at that point right now, you're just checking out the acupuncturist. You may be checking out the chiropractor. We're not going to do that in church. We're going to take you right to where it gets the surgery. Take you right to where you need to be at to get the help that you need. We don't want to mess around. Our time is too late. For us as churches to be messing around, the world's dying and going to hell like in a bread basket. Jesus Christ is coming back soon. And I'm telling you, I want to take in many of my bread baskets as I can. So I'm going to do what I can. So that brings me to this study and the idea on forgiveness. There are three different areas of forgiveness. And if you catch these, it'll help you understand some of the things you do. I I teach one session on what we do in forgiveness. I teach another session on steps of forgiveness. Uh, and then another one just on how we respond to forgiveness. But this one this morning, which is the beginning, is how to understand the three areas of forgiveness. The first area of forgiveness is a psychological forgive- forgiveness. In a psychological forgiveness, the victim initiates this forgiveness. If you have offended me, if Brother John has offended me, and I'm trying not to walk out of my internet, I find that you guys are putting this online this morning, the internet is going to blow your internet. We're going to get five billion hits. So Dr. John over here, he says, uh, (laughs) look at you four-eyed, (laughs) cross-eyed, monkey looking, wearing glasses. Now, when I was a kid, glasses were not a so... uh, uh, a social statement today, everybody wants to wear glasses. When I was three, nobody wanted to make them. Everybody made fun of me when I went to school. And so John went to school with me, and he's making fun of me because I'm cross eyed. And I know I was cross eyed because when I cried, tears run down my back. <laughs> And I wore glasses before they became a social statement. And uh, so he makes fun of me. Well, you know what? That's easy. I just punch him in the mouth, go down the road, and forgive him. I wouldn't really. I just say, you know, John, I forgive you for that. That's easy, isn't it? I just, I bear, I initiate the the forgiveness. I forgive you. You found out last this weekend, my daughter was sexually abused. Uh, my wife and I know them very quick. She's we're related. And to see my wife work through steps of forgiveness three different times with this person. Now, to me, take them out back, hang them by the tree, and beat them to the quid. But that's not godly. And we worked, and I saw this woman work through, walk through more steps of forgiveness to forgive that person. And I wish I had time to tell you all the things that God did for her and restoring to her and blessing her in that forgiveness. Because this pain that we need to forgive is usually caused by someone, fill in the blank, someone that is close to you. You know, you can't hurt me if I don't get close to you anyway. That's why a lot of us don't have any friends. Because if you knew the real me, you wouldn't like me. You wouldn't love me. There's usually by someone that we have helped the most. Why do you think pastors get hurt so much? There's somebody they won to the Lord and got him in church. All of a sudden, something just didn't go right. He didn't turn the page in his Bible just exactly right. And somebody gets offended by it. It probably hadn't happened that here at your church, but it happens. We're going to fix the building up, and everybody likes the idea of getting a building, but they didn't like the color of the carpet the pastor chose. Or why do we not have pews? Why do we have chairs? Who chose this ugly color? I don't think it's ugly, really. 
not pretty, but um, <laughs> there went my glove offering, didn't it? You'd be surprised what people get offended over in church at the pastor. And as I said, even the pastor's wife. Why does the pastor's wife do this? Why does she get to do that? Why does she get to do Why is she the other? Oh, by the way, you know you're the pastor's kid. You ought to act better than that. Those that are, we've helped the most. And then usually it's someone that we worship with. Someone I've been to church with. You know, you can't hurt me if I don't know you. That person out there on the street, they're not gonna they're not gonna offend me very easily. But now you now you can offend me. You can hurt me because I know you. I've become a part of you, so you can become a part of me, and we're a part of a team. So we become friends. Some of you closer, some of you even closer, some of you just there. That, are you following what I'm, what I'm saying? Psychological forgiveness causes by someone that is pretty close to us that we have things to. Children with parents, parents with children, husbands, wives. Oh my goodness, guys. If you're married, get over all the, 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 the simple things that, that, that are in our relationship and learn to forgive. And this is psychological forgiveness. And the, if you've been offended in the relationship, make the initiative to make it right. Love is given. It's not earned. And God's love in John 3.16 was given to you for no other reason than just give it to you. Don't tell me how godly you are when you want to love somebody except if this woman can do anything to keep me from loving her, anything to keep me from loving her, I don't know how to forgive. And I'm not godly. Three things, A, B, C, and I'm not sure how much that's in your notes there, but A, let go of the desire for personal revenge. You just got to let it go. Because here's the problem with that. Back to Brother John offending me when I was wearing glasses. Do you know, 30 years later, he don't remember that. He really don't care. And the person that offended you really doesn't care. You know who forgiveness is for? It's for me. It's for me. So I let him off the hook so he doesn't control me. When you don't forgive someone, you let them control you. So it's a desire for personal then. It is for you, Ephesians 4.32 and James 4.17. And then it lets go of the bitterness. Let go. Let God. How are we doing on time? Okay. Huh? Fifteen minutes. <laughs> you can't see it, but she's doing this to me now. Psychological forgiveness. Number two is reconciliatory forgiveness. Being reconciled is all that big old word. Uh, like I said, we're from Missouri, and when I use a word like that, they want it spelled out in fifteen syllables. Syllables. You know, it's like going hunting. You know, we in 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 Missouri. To go hunt is two is two syllables. Are you going to go hunt, hunt? Two syllables. That's Missouri. And so that's a big word. So I hope that doesn't confuse you. But reconciliatory. The right relationship is offered or restored. Responsibility lies with the offender. They take full responsibility for what they have done. You understand? This will never be a good personal relationship till he takes responsibility and said, Don, I should not have talked like that. I should not have said that about you and your glasses, although you did look kind of funny. <laughs> you follow where I am? Personal relationship with my wife and, and the family member for forgiveness was the fact that that family member owns up to his job, his mistake, his wrong, and said, I was wrong, I should not have done that. And, and I've got, a ton, I told him over the weekend, I've got tons of illustrations that I could prove that, but right now we're on a time basis. Takes full response. 
uh, number three under that, it offers appropriate remorse. If you have wronged somebody, you need to pay a remorse thing back to them. And not, that, that's not the right word I'm looking for. But you repay them for something that you've wronged. Now, I know politically correct, we think we've got to repay everybody that happened to anything that was over, you know, last year, and we've got to go back and repay them for all that. That is not what this is talking about. Get off all that. I didn't say it. <laughs> but it does offer appropriate remorse. And it says, I was wrong. What I did was wrong. I need to be forgiven. I ask you to forgive me. And it establishes boundaries. But John, I don't need to establish the boundary. We're going to be friends whether he makes fun of my glasses or not. With a family member, and I don't know anything about you. That's why I'm using our family. With a family member, we set boundaries. No longer could children be around this family member without an adult there. You follow where I'm going with this? If you're in an abusive relationship, I say get out. If it's physically abusive, get out. Get help. And if you're the abuser in that relationship, you get the help. You should and own up to your stink. You are wrong. Number four, five, six, whatever it is. You show a change of behavior. So you can never be reconciled to it's an absolute change of what you're doing. So John cannot do that anymore for us to be completely reconciled. He changes his behavior about what he says to people that wear glasses. That, I know that's a simple ridiculous illustration but I want you to understand that that and the deepness of this illustration here the change that has to happen in their life it requires a repentance of the wrong that was done so psychological forgiveness I offer psychological forgiveness to someone for me I forgive them. I let them off the hook. I let them go. I may never have a restored relationship. A restored relationship, I can be your friend, but I may never restore that total relationship till you do the part that you need to do, and that's asked for the forgiveness on your part, that we might be reconciled. In other words, you've got to receive and accept and believe what's taking place in your life. Are you following me so far? Because this, I mean, this is a little bit deeper in teaching and, and, than normal, okay? Number three, psychological reconciliatory and then judicial forgiveness. Luke 23:34 Do we need to take a break? <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> feel like you just kind of need to take that break. Jesus looked out on them and and I've got several references to this. Ephesians 4:30 says, "Father, uh, forgiving one another." Matthew 6:12 says, "Forgive us our debts, we forgive our debtors." Luke chapter 23 verse 34. He says, "Jesus on the cross says, "Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing." They knew exactly what they're doing, but somehow God, as a, as a human, on his human side, looked at them and said, Father, please forgive them. They're doing what they've been taught. They do not understand the price and the cost of what they are doing. Judicial forgiveness can only be given by God. What happens, people tell us you need to forgive and forget and get running around. We wonder why we can't forget. I forgot what our time's going. Let me rush on through this. It is a pardoning of a sin debt, a complete removal of the guilt. And I've got several verses of scripture, I think, listed there for you. Uh, and we just, it's an actual 
uh, 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 removal of, of debt as far as the east is from the west, from the, behind my back to remember them no more. Only open confession of wrongdoing and a change of heart. First John 1, 9, confess your sins. It must be received or accepted by the sinner to be reconciliatory forgiveness. Judicial, reconciliatory, psychological. Psychological, that's what you do when you forgive somebody. So reconciliatory is what happens when they accept what they've done and ask for repentance and come back. Judicial forgiveness can only be done by God. You're not that good. I can't forgive any of your debt. I can't forgive any of your sin. God Almighty in creation knew that Jesus was going to have to go to the cross and pay the price for your sin. So let me kind of close it out with this way, okay? And I want to just use the word love, okay? Love, L-O-V-E. Number one, the first thing in love is you're lost. Romans 3.23, 3, 10, all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. John, Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 through 21, we are under the curse from the creation and the fall that we're in. So we are all lost. In other words, we're all doomed and destined to go to a devil's hell because devil, hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for humans. But a lot of humans will end up going there. We're all lost. Oh, that's the offense. In other words, Jesus said in Matthew, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, there was a great separation. And that rich man talking to uh, in Abraham's bosom said, can I go back? There's just such a great chasm here that I can't even speak to them. There's a chasm that's there. Heaven and hell, separation that has happened. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The offense of our sin and Jesus on the cross felt like that God Almighty, his Father, had left him stranded. I believe this. I believe God never left the side. Our sins had separated him into a devil's hell. But God was there and felt that human pain that every one of us feels. And that's what his son was feeling. V, a voluntary sacrifice has to be made. The price has to be paid. Romans, Luke 23, 34, Father forgive them. Romans 5, 8, God commended his love towards while we were yet sinners and again I mean, let me let me kind of illustrate this and we'll bring it to a close can you imagine god almighty we could just picture that me as god right now god almighty and he speaks in existence everything his son's there can you imagine the joy my, we live in branson and i stand on my back porch and look out across that valley and we live on a golf course with a pond and we sit out there quite often we can just sit and listen to the birds and uh our dogs bark but other things it, it, it's absolutely mind-blowing to see the beauty of god and god created and spoke that he spoke into assistance took the dirt of the ground and he created you and i and placed us to have dominion on this earth you imagine the Father and the Son are sitting in the power of the Holy Spirit. All the joy that's there, man, absolutely, you and I spit in the Creator's face. By the way we act, the things we say, and the rejection of it. Jesus says, Father, it must be time. And he said, I believe he said yes. Jesus left the splendor of heaven, came and walked on this earth. A perfect life and 33 years of age stood before a Roman court and was condemned to die. You know the story if you've seen the, the, uh, the offense of the Christ that was the picture was out not too long ago where they, they plucked his beard out and a crown of thorns upon his brow. The, the cat of nine tails upon his back that they just literally ripped him to the bone. That was for your sins and mine. And he climbed up Galgotha's hill, and they took those nails, and they put them in his hands and his feet. They're hanging there on that cross. He 
cried out, Father, forgive them. They placed a spear in his side. Let's go back to the Father one more time. Can you imagine as a father and that being your son? Can you imagine God as a father looking down and seeing that? I picture the Father Almighty, God Almighty, stepping aside from his throne, taking his robe off, setting it to the side, walking out to the edge of eternity. And that same hand that had created the universe reaches up and with one hand could have wiped out all of creation. Everything he'd ever done. All he had to do, just say, I start over. Can you imagine and picture that hand getting ready to go and wipe out everything? And he hears this cry. Father, Father, forgive them. And that same hand just ready to destroy us kneels down on the edge of eternity and he dips in the blood of his own son and writes on every forehead of every man, woman, boy, and girl that's ever been born. Forgiveness. 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 Jesus paid the price. God has forgiven us. Here's the issue. Just like you must learn how to psychologically forgive someone else, reconciliatory takes place when they forgive and ask to be reconciled back. That's what Jesus Christ did for you. And you have the choice today. What are you going to do with what God's done for you? Are you ready to say, God... Today, I want to be reconciled back to Christ. You're here this morning, we'll close. You say, Don, I've never heard that. I'm not sure about that. I, I'm not sure that I've trusted Christ and been reconciled back to him. You know, great pastor in a church family. We'd love to share you that story from the word of God. And I ask you to come this morning or come to your pastor and say, I want to know more. But let's back up just a second to judicial. Some of you here this morning need to cross this aisle and ask some people to forgive you. Some of you parents need to go home this afternoon and call your children and say, I need you to forgive me. I don't understand everything you've done. They don't need to know that. They just need to know you love them and you're going to forgive them or you make yourself greater than God. Some of you kids need to go home this afternoon and sit down with your parents and say, listen, I really been terrible and I need you to forgive me and reconcile some of you need to come to your pastor and say pastor I've done some things and said some things that were not right I need you to forgive me that's being reconciled in the name of God dear father we ask you do on what you can do if there's someone here this morning that's never been reconciled to you never come to the point where they trusted you as their personal Savior. Ask God that they would come and be reconciled to you. A perfect picture of God and the Son. But I think this morning there's many a person that needs to just come to this altar or come to this pastor and say, "I, I just need to be, I need forgiven. I have offended someone. I need to forgive someone that I, that has offended me. And thus restore to the place that we should be restored in serving you in a place that needs the gospel as much as any place I've ever been. In Jesus' name. I want everyone to uh, pray. I I want you right now to begin praying for your neighbor, your spouse, your children. Pray for each other. There's so many things that need to happen in our lives. So many, so many of us truly need to forgive. We've been injured and we want to think that others, uh, that how can we forgive? We have been hurt. And and the truth is, uh, forgiveness begins with each and every one of us. God showed us the way, showed us how to forgive and he's forgiven all of us. All we need to do is uh, believe and receive his forgiveness. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray right now that you would touch the heart of each individual in here today. Father, that you would touch the heart of those who need to ask for forgiveness. Father, that they would do that, that they would reconcile, they would restore uh, the situation that has gone awry. Father, just open their mind and their heart. Help, help the pride to disappear. Help the, 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 the pride that says, uh, I have been offended and you need to correct it. Father, help, help the walls to come down. Father, for some that are here today that they don't know Jesus, they don't, do not know your son, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior, and therefore they're not going to be going to heaven until they receive that, the, the gift of life, eternal life through Christ. And so, Father, I pray that you would touch their heart today. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, I invite you to give your life to him today. And it's, it's quite simple, uh, but yet it is difficult because the difficulty comes in in us letting go. The simple part, God's already made a way and he's made it easy and he's extended his son to us. And so the Bible says that if we believe that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for our sins. We believe that he was raised on the third day. We believe that he is at the right hand of the Father. We believe he is the Savior of the world. Then we're saved. It's, it's a belief. And so if it's your desire to give your life to Christ, I want you to pray this prayer quietly in your heart. Now, understand the words are not what save you. This is a, a road map to help walk you through and to give you a, a date, a time where you said, no, this is the day that I asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Uh, your Salvation comes into belief in your heart. And so these words just help you to bring that to the physical. So if it's your desire to give your life to Christ, you pray this prayer quietly in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, Today I surrender. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you conquered death and hell. I believe you're at the right hand of the Father. I don't understand all of it, but I believe. And so today I give you my life. And I thank you for eternal life. We at Connecting Point Church are excited to have you join us. When you come, you'll experience a friendly, lively, and casual family-like atmosphere that welcomes you as you are. Our messages combine straightforward biblical truths, humor, and life-changing challenges for you to learn and grow in God's Word. We believe in connecting people to Christ, to the plans and gifts He has for them, and with people in our community who share these values. We also believe in reaching out to our local area and the regions beyond. We're dedicated to being a place where your entire family can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ as you begin to understand the roots of the problems and learn to apply the tools for you to triumph over your challenges today. It'll be a breath of fresh air in this unsettled world.